So uh, this is the kind of the kickoff of the content of the course part of this, this event. Um, I want to give you all a bit of context as far as what this thing is that we gave a rather terrible name, um, Biodiversity Informatics Training Curriculum. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably pretty bad at naming things, so um, it ended up with this and, and an unfortunate acronym and everything. But I think if I give you a bit of an introduction, you'll see that it's actually pretty, a pretty neat initiative. Um, at the very least, it's been quite an adventure for me and others who've been involved in it over the years. Um, but essentially, it's responding to the observation that biodiversity informatics is this kind of strange new field, which is to say there are maybe one or two programs, you know, graduate programs in the world that focus centrally on biodiversity informatics. There are no textbooks. And at least when we started the BITC, there were no training resources. There, were no, there was no place you could go other than the primary literature and the gray literature to get a, a view across the whole field of best practices and, and techniques and ideas and concepts. So that's been a, that's been a serious limitation. You, know, you, you really can't go anywhere and say, yes, I did a PhD in biodiversity informatics. Now you can go and do a, a PhD in bioinformatics. And unfortunately, that term has been co-opted. So you could do a PhD in bioinformatics and never hear the word biodiversity, right? Because bioinformatics is about genomes and proteomes and microbiomes and such, but it's not about organisms. And it's kind of unfortunate because bioinformatics ought to be the general term that is an umbrella over everything, including the whole organism informatics. Um, the training resources, I'll bet you somebody will do a textbook sometime soon. And I will, as always, be disappointed in the idea of a textbook because um, they will market it to universities in the U.S. and sell it for $80 or $100. And that's prohibitive even for students in the U.S. Uh, at least in Latin America, they have a nice solution, which is quick photo reproduction. <laughs> and so you can get it for about $5 usually. Um, but the point is that there are not kind of comprehensive resources. If we were talking about population genetics, there are nice comprehensive textbooks that give you a good overview of the whole field. And we don't have that for this field. And at the same time, look at you all. You, you were selected out of how many? 257, 257 applications. Um, there were a lot of good applications. It would have been nice to have had four times as many people, but as you will see, we're already at a maximum. Now, just as an aside, Jesse was at the champion course, so if this group seems big, yeah. the ones we did in Kenya, we were hosted by an institute, ISIPE, and about a week before the course, my host said, um, there are a bunch of people at Isipe who would like to join in the courses. I said, that sounds good. And so we had, for the niche modeling course, I remember we had 55 people. And it was a big mistake on my part. Anyhow, there's a lot of interest. Okay, the BITC Facebook group is now beyond 6,000 people who are members. Um, not all of them are, you know, intimately involved in biodiversity informatics, but there's a lot of interest. And so we have this field that's of interest, we have no organized training resources, and we have some interesting science to do. There's a lot that can be learned from this field. 
Now let's let's get a little bit of an overview of what it is we're talking about with this field, which is to say the blue boxes are kind of biological features that ideally would be kind of under this umbrella of biodiversity informatics or a redefined bioinformatics. So we have, at the most fundamental level, we have genotype, and that by various means interfaces into phenotype, species traits, Aaron, biotic interactions, essentially how different phenotypes interact, um, how those um, genotypes, phenotypes, and, and sets of species interact with their environment and with humans. I guess humans are part of the environment, but they're a rather, a rather special part of the environment. Um, that can take us into this, this general um, area of inquiry of, of population ecology, essentially what maintains or removes populations. Um, and over here into biodiversity loss. This is a paper we published a few years ago and as I guess it's now 14 years since it was published, I think as it gets farther in the past, I like it less and less. So maybe by next course, I won't have this figure in here. But you can go from the blue boxes to the sorts of um, information that we derive about these things. So for example, from genotype and phenotype, we can develop phylogenetic trees that summarize evolutionary history. And from those, we develop our taxonomies. And from all of this stuff about species relationships to their environments, we can get maps of geographic distributions. And from a good understanding of the distributions and the human interactions, we can get to forecasts of change and we can get to conservation and management strategies. Okay, so it, there's this big interacting mess of features of organisms and ways that we can describe them. And then in the black letters, you can see different initiatives that have um, attempted to um, make that information available. So for example, about geographic distributions, there are entities like GBIF, now at, what is it, 1.3 billion um, occurrence records online. Treebase is an online open access resource for phylogenetic trees. And so there's, there's a lot of, of attempts to deal with the information in this field. And they are all very fragmented and very um, segregated. So the population data here don't often link well to the occurrence data there. We'll talk about that into next week. Uh, or the conservation status data may not be well linked to the population data. And so essentially what we have is this really diverse set of types of information that we would ideally want to deal with in this field of biodiversity informatics. We do a really bad job of integrating those types of information. And so we end up kind of boxed in, maybe I do phylogeny, and another person does conservation. And there are probably really interesting and dynamic linkages between different ones of these fields that we don't explore enough. Now let's go down to kind of a more practical level. Yesterday I told you all about digital accessible knowledge, okay? It's digital so we can make copies of it for free. It's accessible so it can be discovered and searched and queried. And it's knowledge in the sense that it's integrated with other kinds of, of or other records, other kinds of data that are relevant. And so we have this, this information 
it's billions of records, but it's probably still nowhere near enough. But I wanted just to bring in this concept of information loss. And this is, this is one of the things that needs to be dealt with in, in biodiversity informatics. At the very start, we have all the biodiversity that's out there in the world. Okay? I just scared myself because when I was a graduate student, my professor had the, whenever he gave a lecture, he would say out there 20 times, 30 times in the course of a lecture. And one of my friends pointed it out to me and I've never been able to listen to that professor ever again because every time he lectures, I'm going one, two, every time he says out there. And it's you know, 20 times per hour. Anyhow, out there, there's all this biodiversity. <laughs> and some of it's been sampled. And a lot of it is the work that remains to be done in the field, out there. Um, but of what's been sampling, some of it has, is still represented by specimens or, or data records. And some of it's been lost. Okay, in World War II, the museum in Dresden was caught in a um, bombardment from the Allies, and the entire contents were lost. Uh, and, you know, by the same token, some researcher might have data accumulated from a lifetime of work, and grow old and pass away, and family doesn't value or know, know the value of that, well, it's lost. So we do lose some information there. Of what's existing, some of it isn't determined. Some of it isn't identified. And all the stuff that's not identified, it's certainly not going to be discoverable or accessible because we don't have that name tag to look for it by. Of what's been identified, Huge amounts are only in analog formats. They're not digital, okay? Of what's digital, some of it has been cleaned and the great majority has not. And when I talk about cleaning, you remember the map I showed you of the Rwandan points in GBIF, right? They were all over this hemisphere. And that's basically a matter of getting in and exploring your data and, and finding the errors and finding the inconsistencies. And so that's a, another loss. When there's noise, when there are errors, when there are problems in the data, you know, those data become <coughs> unusable. And they may in fact be very useful and very important, but they're not usable because they haven't been cleaned. <coughs> Another really important step is, is referencing the data records geographically, which is to say the, the data record might say two mile, two kilometers east of Kigali. Okay, and that in and of itself is a challenge because Kigali now or Kigali in 1900, very different what it means to be two, mile, two kilometers east, right? So there's a whole procedure for georeferencing, and what hasn't been georeferenced is lost. Maybe not permanently, but it's not there right now for the analysis that I want to do. Then one of the biggest bottlenecks is that of publishing and sharing the data openly, okay? Too often in biodiversity science, people consider data to be property. And many around the world think that it should be considered a common good. It's knowledge, and it's knowledge about the natural world. And you may say, I've been working for 10 years to accumulate these data. Well, you know, those data will benefit many people more than you. And so my own rule in my lab is that when data come in the door, they're shared openly. I get into trouble some, sometimes, but it's a, it's a, 
a point of view that makes a big difference in how you do science. You might say, okay, well, here's all the data from my doctoral dissertation. I still have one paper that I want to write about that, so I'm just going to hold on to them. No, Jesse? Right? I mean, how many, how, many, how many situations are there where there's this amazing data set that somebody is hoarding? And so, yeah, there's one more paper to write. And there are probably 50 papers or important analyses or reports or strategies that could be developed with those data if they weren't being hoarded. Another thing, and I'll show you examples of this later in the week, is that of adhering to standards. So you can say, well, I made my data available. They're out there on, you know, in a PDF document, and you can download them from, I don't know, Figshare or Data Dryad. But if you're trying to assemble a large-scale data set, and you have to put 50 or 60 data sets together, all in different formats, you don't, right? You leave that, that data set out. So we have very good standards for how do we structure these data, especially for species occurrence data. We have excellent standards. They're not always followed, but we have excellent standards. If they are followed, it's easy. You can integrate diverse data sets essentially instantly. And that's what you do every time you download some data from GBIF, because those GBIF data are coming from 20, 30, 200, 500 different institutions. And they're being integrated essentially on the fly. And then we ideally would share our data such that they can be um, detected and, and integrated via, via the major um, data portals. And so essentially, do we want to accumulate our data by going to 50 different websites that we find by Google searches? Or couldn't there be just a single portal or a few portals that give us access to this whole ocean of information? So that's this whole process. And what I want you to notice is that all along the way, we have the opportunity over and over and over again to lose information. And it's only the relatively few data records that survive all of those losses that we can use in, in analyses in biodiversity informatics. Imagine if you had your house and the water coming in from the, the, the pipe that runs by on the street, and you had a leak, and another leak, and another leak, and another leak in the plumbing in your house. You go to take a shower in the morning, how much water do you get? Well, that's biodiversity informatics. We tend to lose large amounts, if not the majority of the data that exist, we tend to lose them by one or more of these leakage opportunities. So that's one comment. That's a very kind of low-level information management point. Then a higher level point is this, that if you can think of these kind of three realms, one is what data are available? You know, what's the, the universe of digital accessible knowledge? And what are the technologies that we have? It might be some neat algorithm for um, viewing your, your data in multiple environmental dimensions. It could be lots of things, but technology. And then the real ideas and concepts uh, might be uh, I need a, an effective strategy for conservation of such and such group in such and such region. Or it might be I want to understand um, why this species is declining across its range. Whatever. These are the important things, right? This is, this is what we're trying to learn. And these are more practical things. And what's happened over the history of this field 
too often is that the science that we do is driven by the availability of data and the availability of technology. So these arrows like this drive the ideas and concepts that we pursue. And really, it should be the other way around. It should be, I have this idea, I have this something, that, this question that I, that I really want to answer. What data need to be available and what technology needs to exist to be able to answer those questions? But too often, the flow is the other way. Look at that, there's a neat data set. What can I do with it? Or I just found this new algorithm for doing something, what can, what, what, what can I use it on? That's not good science. The good science starts from the ideas and concepts and pushes out to um, what do you need to get that work done. So that's kind of a selected view of, of biodiversity informatics. It's this big heterogeneous field with challenges that run all the way from basic generation of data up to really big synthetic ideas and questions. And you kind of have to work across um, very diverse areas of inquiry to work in this field. So 10 years ago, several of us were asking, how could we build um, greater capacity around the world for work in this field? And so we started, we, we experimented a lot, we gave some courses, this is 15, 20 years ago, we gave some courses that would be kind of embarrassing now, um, but they were test runs and we got better and better and we'll certainly screw things up in this course, but hopefully, well definitely it'll be better than how we would have screwed this course up 10 years ago. So just some thoughts about how you would do that. My firm belief is that in-person teaching is always best. The ability to ask questions and interact. Um, there may be some things that we can do taking advantage of the internet. I mean, right now, kind of real-time video conferencing to teach a week-long course here is probably not going to work. Um, it'll be frustrating. but. Um, we can certainly, you know, what, there are 20 of us here right now, we can certainly reach 200 people, maybe not as effectively, but to give them some access. So all those people who applied for this course and didn't get in can still have some access to what we talk about, okay? Or 10 times that many people around the world. Um, another comment, is that we can keep the technologies that we use really simple and really common. Uh, there are a lot of distance learning platforms and things like that out there in the world. And often they require quite a bit of kind of infrastructure to be able to use them. And so we opted pretty early on for simple technologies that are in basically every internet cafe around the world. YouTube, right? I have a few challenges with, with political considerations like YouTube is not available in China and things like that. But many, many, many sectors of the world have pretty ready access to, to that sort of program. And so the idea was to kind of bridge between in-person teaching and taking advantage of where the internet is now and see if we can't provide content globally at very low cost to the user um, and relatively little effort to the providers. So essentially that's, that's where we started. That, involve, that evolved into the idea of doing in-person training courses capturing digital video of all of the content, publishing that video. That much we've done pretty well. 
and then what what we're still to well we've started it we've prototyped everything but we haven't done it across all of the material is ideally everything will have English subtitles and then those subtitles can be crowdsourced and turned into um, subtitles in a bunch of other languages. And the other information, like the data packets and things like that, that you all will be working with, those can be just put online and, and people can download them if they wish. So we took that idea to the JRS Biodiversity Foundation. Um, JRS has a mission of promoting conservation of biodiversity. Um, when I captured this screen capture, they were working kind of around the, the tropics of the world. Now they're much more focused in East, East Africa. Um, but they very generously funded a first round of the BITC uh, we submitted the proposal in January of 2012. It was funded by mid-year. Um, and that's essentially what we, what, we, um, what we promised. So we, we said three cities. We actually did double that many. Um, online content, we fil fulfilled that. And the funding was just enough to get that done. Uh, Kate Ingenloff who is finishing up her doctorate at, at the University of Kansas. She essentially co-directed the, the program with me. Um, the content covered a pretty broad realm of how to describe new species, how to capture biodiversity data retrospectively. So, those of you who work at herbaria or in museums, you have all those thousands of specimens that just have an old yellowing handwritten paper label. How do you turn that into usable, digital, accessible knowledge? Data cleaning, we talked about that a bit. Data publishing, niche modeling, uh, other analyses that you can do with biodiversity data, building biodiversity informatics institutions, biodiversity inventories, um, developing national biodiversity diagnoses, uh, implementing biodiversity conservation, and public health applications of biodiversity data. And so that was in-person courses in Nairobi, Cape Town, Accra, Entebbe, Cameroon, I'm forgetting one, Ethiopia. Um, and then a couple online courses to fill in the gaps. And so we got together around Africa. This is in a, a course in, in Ghana. And in Cameroon, uh, several of the courses had field components. So, you know, the, the biodiversity inventories course included um, being out in rainforest in Cameroon for a couple weeks and doing herpetological plant and bird inventories. Um, and then to supplement a bit more, we developed several other modules um, not the sort of thing you want to do a full course on, but how do you publish scientific papers? How do you develop proposals for uh, funding um, using QGIS, which we're going to use on, in this course, in biodiversity informatics and using R. Um, that was 2012 to 2015. And essentially what it resulted in was a web page that presents the whole curriculum. So you can pick any topic amongst what I just listed for you and go and attend um, a course 
via digital video um, that lasted a week or two on that topic. And just as in this course, um, those courses included concepts and theory and hands-on and everything. Um, we also needed a journal that was focused on the area of biodiversity informatics. And curiously, that did not exist. Uh, I can't believe that none of the big commercial publishers didn't grab that name, but we grabbed it first. And so this journal is titled Biodiversity Informatics. We publish not biodiversity science, but the informatics part of biodiversity science. Um, been publishing it now for 12 years. It's low volume. It's zero cost to publish at difference with most journals in, the, in our field right now. Um, and I shouldn't be proud of this or happy about this, but I am. Um, the journal was just this year listed in Web of Science. So I disagree massively with caring about impact factors. I think it's a huge error in the scientific world. But many of you are under pressure to publish in international peer-reviewed journals that are listed in Web of Science. So now we come out of the shadows just a little bit with this journal. Uh, for faster communication, we have a uh, Facebook page. I started a Facebook account for myself only because of this. You can see we're above 5,200 people in the group. Um, you can also see my lab. Um, it's gotten bigger since you left, Aaron. Uh, this was our population maximum. We had 32 people from 16 countries in the lab all at once, and so we had to take a picture. Um, we have a YouTube channel, and you would think that a YouTube channel about biodiversity informatics would be of pretty low interest, but there is a trace of the viewership. So you can see we've had almost a quarter million views 1.7 million minutes of viewership. Um, it's kind of neat to see, but these peaks are because we started a, a series of online seminars. And we would do them once a month. And so you can see they're kind of regular in spacing. And that, those were events where yeah, 50 or 100 people would tune in. And then last year, we did a course, it was in Spanish, but it was a, a, an advanced course in ecological niche modeling. And you can see that you know, we were proud of these peaks before, and then that course quadrupled them. So we had basically 500 people who finished the course, who you know, start to finish, worked all the way through it. And it lasted, I think, four months. Um, and so now, big mistake, but now, in January, we're going to start an English language ecological niche modeling course. And this one's going to last probably seven months by the end of it. Uh, weekly lectures, and so it's, it's going to be intensive. But I'm assuming that we'll see another big pulse of, of activity. So BITC 1 closed down kind of early in 2016. Our last course was December of 2015 in Ethiopia. It took a while to get the, the funding arrangements together and to uh, twist Aaron, Aaron's arm to kind of take the lead in, in this second round. Um, but the, the funding for BITC 2 started in 2019. There were a lot of lessons learned from kind of what worked and what didn't work as well in BITC 1. And so among those things were we noticed that the really successful courses were the ones that were longer and that were very much focused on um, 
giving people products that they could, you know, in some cases even publish, but at the very least um, take home and work on further. Um, the JRS Foundation really wanted a policy dimension, and so we've kicked that off wonderfully yesterday, thanks to Beth. Um, and so we're, we're kind of exploring the idea of courses that last two weeks, that have serious hands-on dimensions to them, um, and you guys are kind of this partial experiment of, of how do we do a bigger scale? Um, definitely my family said no more two trips to Africa per year. Um, <laughs> they, they definitely said, we don't, we don't want you away that much. And so, you know, this is a lot of time away. Okay, Aaron and I are directing this, but we're also asking our instructors to take two weeks out of their lives. And so, you know, it is much appreciated. Um, it is a significant time investment. Um, so, as you guys, I hope, know, we're talking about ecosystem services and essential biodiversity variables right now. Um, we've got two more courses, and they're tentatively planned for Malawi and either Namibia or Botswana for the next two years, and the topics are tentatively uh, focused on baseline biodiversity data and resurvey efforts, and then another course on bridging between kind of the science and the policy, or the data and the policy. Um, all of those details remain to be determined, but this is designed as a three-year effort and we'll, we hope that there'll be continuation afterwards, but at the same time we hope that the, the leadership and the um, kind of the, the, the brains behind it will keep shifting because you don't want to settle into one set of people. It's usually a bad idea. So, you guys know about um, Aaron and me, you can that's kind of a general email, or you can just use our personal emails, which you'll see many times during the course. So any questions about the BITC?